So my assignment for this conference was to uh, talk about the connection between uh, cognitive biases, discrimination, and human rights. Uh, and uh, one important thing to have as background information there is uh, how important uh, the absence of any kind of discrimination is on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So if you think about the first articles of the Universal Declaration, Article 1 uh, is insisting on the equality of, uh, of all people as human beings, and then Article 2 lists a number of categories with regard to which people have often been discriminated, like color and gender and political views and things like those, uh, and insists that they not be discriminated against along such categories. So in a way, Article 1 and 2 are say really the same thing, except one says it positively and the other says it negatively, namely that uh, everybody uh, has a certain status as a human being and at the level of humanity as a whole, we ought not to discriminate against each other. Um, so that's an important point uh, on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, of course, uh, historically, we know uh, discrimination occurs quite routinely, occurs in every known society. So the historical evidence already suggests that it's very hard to have a society in, in which we do not practice discrimination. Uh, but then in recent decades, we have also learned quite a bit from cognitive psychology about how um, uh, how the brain works, and we actually have learned that um, the kind of behavior, the kind of behavior that leads to discrimination, uh, so uh, group favoritism, things like that, is actually hardwired in our brain. So we are by nature not creatures who can easily live up to uh, any kind of uh, universal equality demand, uh, as the Universal Declaration embodies it. Um, and the reason for that uh, is that we come <clears throat> from a certain evolutionary context um, where uh, human morality has emerged uh, over many millions of years, strengthening the performance of small groups. Uh, so if you think about the, the sweep of um, human history, so uh, some 60 to 80,000 years ago, small groups of humans, small bands of humans, left Africa and they populated the globe. And that success in populating uh, the globe became possible because they worked very well as small groups. So small groups, about 100, 100 to 200 people. Uh, and so within groups of that sort, our moral senses and moral intuitions have emerged uh, evolutionarily to strengthen the functioning of such groups. So we have uh, we operate pretty well within hierarchies and groups of that size. We have fairness intuitions that work well within groups of that size. We have shared understandings of what's sacred uh, that work well within these groups. But um, once we live in more complicated structures, uh, once we live in much larger structures, once we live in more diverse structures, we have a problem transferring these moral instincts that, ev that evolved evolutionarily to the kind of modern setting that we have, like global society, interconnected societies, diverse societies. So we still have the same brains, uh, the same kinds of brains that we had 50,000 years ago, uh, but we live in societies that are facing very different challenges uh, these days. And, uh, and that's the source of, uh, of, of many problems. So evolutionarily speaking, uh, a lot of simplifying mechanisms have uh, emerged a lot of uh, a lot of biases, a lot of heuristics that, again, within small groups, work very well. But it's it's a problem once we are uh, merging uh, uh, in, into larger societies. So, so um, in particular, uh, the the way morality has evolved is that there are lots of mechanisms that put the group above the individual, that was in a way the recipe for success, right? That we are capable of doing that, that we are capable of being altruistic in this way, that we favor the group over our personal interests. But that also means we are favoring the group that we belong to over other groups that, uh, that we do not belong to. And so it's because of that <clears throat> that we have a hard time being genuinely fair-minded when it comes to questions that 
uh, go across uh, different groups, the, the one that we belong to included, and then also uh, other groups. And so we are observing a lot of phenomena that are sometimes summed up under this rather ugly but useful term of bounded ethicality. Yeah? So bounded ethicality uh, is, uh, is meant to describe this phenomenon that most of us are not harboring bad intentions, but we have limited perspectives in how we go about doing good things. So we, uh, we focus on ourselves much more than we focus on other people. So we overemphasize our great contributions to many things. And simple examples is everybody uh, remembers very well how, you know, when they took out the household garbage uh, last and, you know, we are overemphasizing in such ways the, the uh, you know, our own contributions, uh, which in the larger scheme of things are actually uh, quite limited. But um, <clears throat> so bounded ethicality means that our own perception of our moral performance is actually uh, is, is overstating certain things about us to favor us uh, quite substantially. Uh, but then more importantly, it also in a collective context uh, leads to phenomena like ethical fading. So ethical fading means that we are very focused on concerns that matter to our group, to people like us, to make sure that our children can go to a good school and have a good future. And we're not really noticing that because we are so focused on that, the concerns of other people are kind of fading away. Right? They're falling by the wayside. Uh, we are... Uh, we are very much inclined to do good things for people who have done good things for us or for people who are like us or uh, for people who have, and who have some, something in common for us. So we're doing, we're trying to do good things for them. Uh, say like a politician might try to get jobs for um, her clientele, right? just to make sure that people who have supported her will also be, uh, will be rewarded for that. And so the point here isn't uh, that somebody like that is trying to actively discriminate against other people, but these other people are just not very much on the radar here. They're falling again, and they're falling by the wayside. So, so favoritism in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, distribution of advantage is, uh, uh, is another phenomenon under bounded ethicality. And so the interests of other people are often by, are falling by the wayside because of this phenomenon of, uh, of, of bounded ethicality. And, and so in that regard, there's, there's a lot to do. So for the human rights movement as a whole, it matters quite a bit that, that we become aware of these phenomena that, uh, that even though the Universal Declaration very clearly insists on absence of discrimination, this is hard for us to do as humans. And so neglect of human rights concerns uh, is a common phenomenon in organizations just because of these phenomena of favoritism and ethical fading, all the, eth the bounded ethicality that goes in. So it matters to recognize that at the level of, um, of uh, human rights organizations. It also matters at the individual level. It is incredibly hard to work with, all the, with this understanding of bias that we have obtained through cognitive psychology, where we constantly look uh, at the world through perspectives that come from within the context that we, are, uh, that we have grown up in. Uh, and it's very hard to genuinely understand what the world looks like uh, from the point of view of somebody who comes from a completely different context. Yeah. And this is uh, something that, uh, that thinking, cognitive reflection, has a very hard time accomplishing. Uh, reflection, our own uh, values might just strengthen our prejudices. What's really needed here is to come to a genuine understanding of what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes, in the shoes of a member of a different group, uh, which is actually much more easily accomplished through art and storytelling than through systematic thinking. And so I think one great thing about this conference for that reason also was that it brought in a lot of artistic perspectives to, to, uh, you know, to supplement the scientific and you know, philosophical understanding that we can also obtain. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, so the human rights movement has a long way to go. Uh, individuals in the human rights movement, I think, have a long way to go, uh, coming to terms with who we are, evolutionarily uh, speaking. Uh, one striking example of how um, also just plain racist bias gets, uh, gets in the way is the founding of the two international uh, tribunals in the 1990s, one for the former Yugoslavia, and one for Rwanda, so they both had genocidal episodes uh, in these countries. 
uh, and it's pretty well established uh, simply from you know interviews with people who were involved in in establishing these uh, tribunals that uh, there would not have been political will to establish a tribunal for Rwanda for people from Africa if it hadn't been done anyway for people from Yugoslavia. So, so this is a case study really of how um, biases, favoritism go, uh, how they work, right? Because the people who established these courts were successful white people and they had no qualms and difficulties doing something like this for other white people getting massacred. But if, hadn't, if it hadn't been for white people getting massacred in Yugoslavia, chances are black people getting massacred in Rwanda uh, wouldn't have, uh, but that would not have been sufficient to create a court. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that is the, that's the way in which biases are operating, cognitive biases are operating in the human rights movement. So, so we have a long way to go, but there's a, there's a lot of interesting research being done right now. So we have a, we, we can get a lot of help in the work that needs to be done here.